I have a lovely new book here that Norm and I have really enjoyed looking at. I read some of this back in seminary, and it was a little dull, I thought, but it isn't dull now. The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis, more than 500 years old, one of the greatest devotional books ever written. And this is a new reading, a new translation, you might say, of the original 1441 Latin autograph by William C. Creasy. Dr. Creasy is here with us. Bill, it's so good to have you. Okay. Bless you. It's, it's good to be here. All the way from Los Angeles. All the way, yeah. I understand you teach at UCLA. I teach in the English department at UCLA, uh -huh. that's correct. Specifically, what do, you, what do you teach? Well, I teach writing courses, literature courses, and I teach the Bible as well. We have a one-year-long Bible course. We begin Genesis in the fall, and we go all the way through Revelation by the end of June. Wow. So, through the Bible in a year. <laughs> that's all right. I like that. And that's, that is a, a credit, a course for credit? It's a course for credit. Three courses, actually. We, we're on a quarter system, so we Three have terms. fall, winter, spring. And it's three courses that link together to do the whole Bible. Are your classes little or large? Uh, they're rather large, actually. Um, we have uh, usually about 50 people who begin the class. And, uh, and for the most part, they stick around all the way through. Um, so it's a good class. That is a pretty good, good size class. class. Yeah. 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 Uh, tell us about your own spiritual walk. Well, gosh, that's a, a story in itself, isn't it? Um, it is for all of us. For all of us, that's true. I grew up here in, in Pittsburgh and uh, grew up in, a, fortunately, in a, in a godly home and, and, uh, and a solid church. And like most people, I suppose, perhaps many people, uh, after I left high school, uh, I went into the Marine Corps and then off to college after that and drifted away, drifted away from the church and uh, came back to it really as an adult at nearly 30 years old. Uh, 30 years old, I, I really became a Christian. And uh, Thomas of Kempis and the Imitation of Christ uh, played a role in that, uh, in a very important one. Now, that was part of your graduate studies, wasn't it? It was. It was, right. I wrote my PhD dissertation on, on Thomas of Kempis. Is that right? Yeah. So we've been together for quite a while. I guess you have. Yeah. Yes. Um, when, do you remember the the point in your life where you really committed your life to Jesus Christ. Can you, can you recall it? I, I can recall it specifically. And I think there was a lot of preparation leading up to it. You know, the foundation was laid in, in childhood. Uh, but that point where I really committed myself to Christ uh, came as an adult um, in South Carolina. I was on a retreat uh, at a monastery, Mepkin Abbey in South Carolina. And it was quite late at night, and I was in the church, in the little chapel uh, at Mepkin Abbey, and praying. And, uh, and I had an overwhelming sense of, of the presence of God. And, and during that time, you know, during the, those moments of prayer, uh, that was when I took my life in my hands and, and gave it to Christ and said, use me for what you will. Mm. That's beautiful. Praise God. Now, I understand that in your Catholic Church, you teach the Bible every week, is that right? I do, yes. Right. There in, in Los Angeles. Right. In, in my church, uh, St. Paul the Apostle Church in, in Los Angeles, uh, it's a rather big parish, uh, right near UCLA. And uh, I teach two Bible classes, one on Wednesday morning uh, that meets at 7 o'clock, 7 to 8 o'clock. Um, and we have about 50 people who come to that regularly. And I teach through the whole Bible, just like at UCLA. But we're taking um, anywhere from six to nine months per book. So we're on the 33-year program. <laughs> and, uh, and I teach another class that we just began at my parish on Monday evenings from 7 to 9, uh, 52 weeks a year uh, for five years. And I'm teaching through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, in five years. And we have over 200 people coming to that. So it's quite a... Any uh, Baptists a showing up? Oh, a number of Baptists showing up. Yeah. <laughs> half of our, half of the audience, half of the people there, uh, are from not from the parish itself, but from the surrounding churches. Protestant uh, churches. Protestant churches, right? I love it. I right. love it. In, in, I'm in, an ecumenic. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my pastor, Father Bob Rivers, a uh, you know, wonderful pastor, and uh, he introduced, uh, welcomed everyone on the first night of the Bible study, and and introduced uh, me, and. And he looked, the people kept coming in and coming in, and, and he looked out at the audience and he said, 
what is this, a group of Baptists, you know, coming to a Catholic church for Bible study? And, uh, and I said, oh, they will be, you know. But uh, quite a good group of people. Okay, I'm going to ask you a real tough question. Um, about two weeks ago, we had uh, Father Diorio from Boston, mm -hmm. who's got a, one of the most wonderful healing ministries in the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and during the evening, and, and you know, I've I've seen him before, you know, and, and and I was actually returning from California myself. Norm and I were out there for a conference, but uh, uh, so we were not here. But during the during the program, at one point, he prayed to Mary, and we got a tremendous hostile response I can uh, imagine. on the telephone over the next couple of days. And uh, now, okay, now, you're not the one who prayed to Mary there, but you're a Roman Catholic, and so I'm sure there are people thinking about it. The Protestants just can't stomach this, you know. And That's... Uh, so would you speak to the issue as a Catholic? I, I, all right, I will. Um, I, I can't speak for the church itself. Uh, you know, none of us can really, but uh, not us Catholics, but any of us, we can speak as individuals. Um, that's a difficult topic, and, and one, Mary, is a difficult topic in, an, in a group of people composed both of Catholics and Protestants. Uh, there are, in teaching the Bible, there are about, uh, oh, I'd say, three what I call hot spots you know, in such an audience, and, and when we deal with Mary and the brothers of the Lord, uh, that's one of those hot spots. Um, and, un and it's unfortunate. Mary is a, a, a model of faith. Yes. Mary is to the New Testament what Abraham is to the Old, you know, uh, a model of Christian faith. And, and it's unfortunate that that divides us and, and elicits that kind of visceral response. Um, and Catholics respond in the same way uh, to, to uh, Protestant, the Protestant emphasis on being born again, you know, the, the, the strong emphasis on that. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a response there. From my position, uh, Mary is a model of faith and, and should be seen as such. Uh, we pray to God through Jesus with Mary and the saints, us being among the saints. You know, the proper object of prayer is God. Now that's your practice. That's my practice. As a Roman Catholic. As a Roman Catholic, yes. Okay. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate your saying that, and thank you for being so gracious in your answer. Uh, as I understand it, what I've been told is that, what I've been taught for years is that the, uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church places the Bible and its church tradition on, on a par, pretty much. But with each, each individual mm -hmm. person, I'm sure that varies, but that generally speaking. And so right. church tradition has an important role in the church, which Protestants in general do not have that, that way. The, the Bible is, is our supreme right. uh, authority here on this earth right, right now. Right. Or Protestants don't emphasize tradition, but certainly Protestants have tradition. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I change the subject? Yeah, I was just about to, but I, I wanted... had to deal with that issue. Well, it was very good. I wanted to ask you, why did you write this or, or redo this book? The Imitation? Mm -hmm. The Imitation of Christ by Thomas well, Akempis. As I said earlier, the, the Imitation has been a very important book to me. Uh, the Bible is a more important book. You know, scripture is a, at the very center uh, of my relationship with God. Uh, but the imitation of Christ, uh, Thomas was a, Thomas Kempis, Thomas of Kempen was, he was a, a Dutchman. He was a Dutchman and uh, lived in the 15th century and was a monk, actually a friar, an Augustinian friar, uh, Augustinian canon. And so he was a priest, right? He was a priest, yes. And uh, the, the imitation was such a, 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 a personal book to me. Uh, it, it accompanied me. Uh, when I became a Christian. It accompanied me through my dissertation. And later on, oh, 10 years after that, I suppose, um, I went through a very difficult time in my own life, and there was Thomas ready at hand. Uh, I took a, a, a leave and, uh, and went up to the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. I had a six-month... World's great library. Oh, it's one of the world's great libraries and a beautiful place. And I took a copy of Thomas's autograph manuscript. I had a Xerox copy of it uh, from the Royal Library in Brussels, and I had that with me. 
And, and I was working through the difficulties in my own life on, the, on this six-month uh, readership at the Huntington. And I began reading the Latin manuscript again. And oh, in, in the original Latin? In the Latin, the one that Thomas had actually written with his very hand. You know? at, at the end, the colophon at the end says, by Thomas, uh, Thomas of Kempen, by the hand of Thomas of Kempen, he actually wrote it. And I began reading it. And Excuse me, just a moment. Could, I need to realize it was just before the printing press was invented. That's so right. It had to be done by it hand. It had to be done by hand. And I began reading that manuscript and thinking about what he was saying. And, uh, and, and it was overwhelming to me. And I had, read, I had written a dissertation on it. I, I had certainly read it before. Uh, but it became much more personal to me. And most people hadn't read the imitation, even at the Huntington Li Library, among the scholars at the Huntington, you know, the imitation of Christ. Well, no one had heard of it. Um, the imitation of Christ has been published in more languages and more editions than any book except the Bible. Really? And people today haven't heard of it. Um, that's what he says in the that's what, beginning. Right. right. And, uh, but th we find that remarkable because we just don't have the book around. Everybody knew about the imitation of Christ uh, two generations before us and before that. And it's the only book that survived the Reformation intact. Both the Catholics and the Protestants claimed it. You know? <laughs> uh, the Catholics, well, he was one of ours. And the, well, uh, I think it's important that I say, uh, now our denomination is the Church of the Brethren. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that means yes, anything. It's it a very small, mm -hmm. originally Pennsylvania Dutch. Mm -hmm denomination out of Germany right. and uh, we uh, uh, when I studied our church doctrine our denominational doctrine mm -hmm. we trace it right back to the group that Thomas Akempis was part of the, the brethren the of the common, of the common life, life right in the 15th century right. 14th century I guess right so the Catholics claimed Thomas as one of theirs the Protestants said well that was the beginning of the Reformation the imitation of Christ <laughs> uh, uh, so our, we my, both hang on my to professor it. of church history he traced it step by step mm -hmm. right back to right. Holland <laughs> right. right but but it, I had a very close relationship with Thomas. And sitting at the Huntington Library, I, I began reading it, and, and people didn't understand it. I thought, if, if I can take what Thomas wrote and translate it in such a way that people can respond to it, as the original readers did. Thomas wrote uh, those short little chapters. Uh, the, the Imitation of Christ is composed of very short chapters. Yes. Um, Thomas wrote those, I believe. He was novice master at his monastery, and he had a group of young men. And it was his job to train them uh, in a life of sanctity, of holiness. And he wrote these little chapters for his group of novices, and he'd give them one. And then read it and talk about it, and, and, and then a little later he'd write another one. And they'd read it and talk about it. Eventually, they all came together as the imitation of Christ. The imitation of Christ is really only the title of the first chapter, not of the book. It's a set. It's like they're like pearls on a chain. You know? And uh, so I tried to translate it in such a way that people could respond to it out of their own life experience. And 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 I hope it worked. I, I would, the, there's four books in there. Of course, the fourth book isn't doesn't isn't quite as meaningful. Mm -hmm. I guess to, it would be more to a Roman Catholic, I think. But uh, it wasn't as meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, the first three books, and as I said earlier, I, I read parts of it mm -hmm. in seminary. It was dry. But it's the difference is the way you've translated it. You've got it in nice, free-flowing, modern English. Well, thank you. Thank you. Norma, you want to say something? Well, I just, I think that we've talked a lot about the book. And uh, here in Chapter 8, uh, the title is Of Intimate Friendship with Jesus. I mean, that's, that's a good one. And uh, another one, uh, of loving Jesus above all else. Mm -hmm. So, it, it's a... A blessed book, I think. It really is. Now, you know, many, many publishers, Christian publishers, have published uh, devotional books. They're being written every year by the dozens every year, devotional books. This is one that has stood the test of time. And it's something each chapter, as Bill mentioned, is uh, short. And you can read one a day. For how many days would that be? Take you through about a year, wouldn't it? Take you through a year at least. Yes. And uh, just a great devotional book. It's The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. But you, what you have to get is the new reading by 
Dr. William Creasy. Uh, Dr. William Creasy is published by Mercer University Press, and uh, uh, you can get that through a Christian bookstore, I'm you can sure. get it through a Christian bookstore. Mercer, if they don't have it, they'll order it. Right. Mercer publishes the hardback, the, the pretty blue one, and it's also available in paperback through Ave Maria Press, which is the Notre Dame Press. Okay. Here's another book of remembering God's many blessings. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the imitation of Christ, uh, assume, Thomas was writing it for those novices, and it assumes that the reader is a saved person. It doesn't talk about salvation. It talks about sanctification, mm -hmm. about living out the Christian life. Yeah, I noticed that when I was, was reading mm -hmm. through in preparation for, for the, today's program. And uh, again, he is talking directly to um, novices in the monastery. But you'd be amazed at how much of it fits you and me. It's really something. And um, uh, uh, of the love of solitude and silence. How much solitude and silence do we have in our lives today? Not very much. Most we certainly Americans need more. are afraid of it. Yeah. How, how long has the book been out? Uh, my translation of yes. the book? It was published right at the very, uh, right at the beginning of 1990, so it's been out a few years now. So have you had any responses of people that have read your book and have had some experiences? I, I have, actually. When it, when it came out, um, and it's, people I, I think have appreciated it. And uh, it was a book club selection at, at, uh, when it first came out. Yeah. So it did have a rather wide readership. And, and I got letters. I was amazed. You know? <laughs> I got letters from people saying that they had, just, let, just as Russ said, well, I read this in seminary at one time, and it was dry as dust. You know? but, but I'm so happy to have it now. Uh, I had one letter from a, a, a nun who had read it years ago. And she said, I, I always thought I should like it, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I like never did. It. She said, and now I do, you know, and, and, you know, 50 years have gone by since I first read it, and, and, and I, yeah. I've enjoyed it. Chapter 23 it. in the first, see, it's four books, so chapter 23 in the first book um, of thinking about death. Now, we don't, modern Americans just don't like to think about death. Yeah. It's something, but it, he, he just says, here it is. Now read yeah. about it. Very soon it will be over with you here. Then see how things stand. Today we are and tomorrow we are gone. And we are, when we are taken out of sight, we soon pass out of mind. Oh, the dullness and hardness of our hearts that think only of the present and do not look forward more to the future. I could go on, folks. It's powerful. It packs a wallop. And well, you mentioned, Russ, that... that yeah, Thomas wrote it for the novices, and, and perhaps a novice, you know, that phrase novice doesn't mean a lot to a Protestant audience, but a novice is just a beginner in the Christian life. We've all been there, you know, and we're all beginners in, in a very important way. And I think what Thomas has to say to those young men 500 years ago, uh, it, it has a great urgency and, and immediacy in our own lives, whether we're brand new Christians or we're mature Christians. Well, that's what I noticed. It has this immediacy. Okay, so this one chapter didn't speak to me, but the next one next did. Next one will. That's it. It's like uh, a little girl was in church uh, about a century ago with, uh, with her mother. Uh, it's a great preacher in London, Charles Spurgeon, was preaching. Mm -hmm. And a little girl leaned over to her mother and says, Mommy, how does he know what goes on in our home? <laughs> that's kind of the way this book yeah, is. Yeah. How does he know what's going on in my life? Right. And you know, you'll, you'll read the book and you'll say, I, I've heard this before. And I tried, it, I tried in the hardback to make a list of all the scriptural quotations and allusions. Well, Thomas was so steeped in the Bible. He lived to be 92 years old. And he lived with the Bible, with, with scripture. And you can't tell where scripture stops and Thomas starts. You know, in his very thinking, uh, the, the phrasing of Scripture and, and, the, and the substance of Scripture is, is just embedded in the man. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And you read it and you go, this sounds like, you know, Matthew. Uh, yeah. And it all comes right back to you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'd like to recommend this for Protestants and Catholics, Catholics alike. Of the Royal Road of the Holy Cross. And um, here is the book three. This is one that... If you've been hurt real bad, it's really something of inner comfort, of inner comfort. And it, it's kind of like a dialogue between Jesus and a disciple. And I like the way he talks so informally of Jesus, you know. 
it just comes, just comes, rolls out of him. You know that the name Jesus was on his lips. All the time. All the time. And, and he says at one point on friendship uh, that uh, we have many friends, uh, but Jesus should be your best and most intimate friend. Well, to say that to a man 500 years ago, or to say it to you tonight, uh, is the same. Yeah. He's putting these words in, in the mouth of Jesus. I taught the prophets from the beginning, and even now I have not ceased to speak. But many people cannot hear my voice, for they have chosen not to listen. They are more eager to hear what the world has to say than to listen to God. And they are more hungry for what the world has to offer than for what pleases God. So, um, 500 that, years go by, I mean, nothing changes. If the shoe changes. fits, you put yeah. it on, right? <laughs> I, I, really, I really had fun. I, and, you know, to, um, to remember, you know, having been in seminary all those years ago, and I did not enjoy reading the, the, the parts of it that I was assigned to read. Uh, I'll just frankly say I, I didn't enjoy it. And I had just gotten saved, too. Mm -hmm. So um, here, here's a good one, of admitting our own weaknesses. Oh, we hate that, don't we? Yeah. All right, if you'd like to order the uh, paperback, too, it's available it's through Ave paperback. Maria Press. And here's an 800 number. You can order it and use your credit card, I'm sure, right? I think so. Okay, it's 800-282-1865. That would be 1-800-282-1865. You have to keep your pen and paper handy if you watch Cornerstone Television, okay? You don't ever want to forget that. I uh, want to tell you that if this conversation of the first interview we had and of our conversation with our guest now, uh, Bill, has touched your heart and you don't think you have the relationship that people have that are reading this book and that will read this book, we're always ready to, to receive your phone call here. So you dial the number on your screen and let whoever is at the other end of the line pray for you for whatever your need is. Because I really think that the conversation on both of these interviews on this program has really gotten attention from people maybe that have never thought about Jesus before Russell. Amen. And I don't ever want to lose an opportunity to invite someone to call in here for prayer. Amen. Well, here's a young lady from Arkansas who just called in and accepted Jesus Christ. Praise the Hallelujah. Lord. When you were talking about being born again, Bill, that's what's just happened to her. Well, praise, praise God for God. that. So um, we want to pray for these folks who have called in. Father, we thank you for each one who's called in for prayer. Thank you for the miracle report there. We thank you for this salvation. We thank you for each of these miracles in the making. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Bill Creasy, thank you so much. And God bless you. Teaching the Bible at UCLA. I love that. Well, thank that you very much. I love it too. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have you come here and teach a course for a whole year on the Bible. <laughs> bless you. Happy to do it. <laughs>